Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, what works and what doesn't. Nearly 500 million people are now living in countries with negative interest rates. They're meant to get people spending money. But this week, we'll examine the growing evidence that consumers around the world are doing just the opposite. Also this week, a dramatic location to talk economics were on board the aircraft carrier Giuseppe Garibaldi, where Eurozone leaders held a mini-summit this week on life after Brexit. Because it seems Europe can't simply wait for the UK to figure out what Brexit means. Plus some good news from the world of renewable energy. New data suggesting we're generating more energy from the sun and wind than ever before. We'll find out what's made the difference and how to keep it on track. So we're starting this week in a valley in Wyoming, USA called Jackson Hole. Probably not the most glamorous sounding of locations, but every year, bankers from the US Central Bank and leading economists gather there to figure out just what to do about this thing we call the global economy. And if you've been watching this show recently, you'll know they've got their work cut out for them. Because ever since the financial crisis, central banks have been trying to plug holes in a ship that just keeps springing leaks. By and large, they've used quantitative easing, buying up government bonds, hoping that it'll pump more money directly into the economy. Now they're going for negative interest rates, because in that upside-down world, paying someone to borrow money may actually be a good thing. It gets people lending and spending. But now an in-depth study from Standard & Poor's on the impact of sub-zero rates across the developed world is warning they have unintended consequences for the world economy and could possibly lead to cash hoarding by consumers, which isn't really productive for anyone. What it also means is that the so-called have-nots aren't even getting a chance to become the haves, creating a wider wealth gap than ever before. We're going to look at that shortly, but first, Maximilian Kunkel is joining us from Zurich. He's an investment strategist with UBS there. Max, we discuss interest rates and growth and the like a, a lot on this program, but this idea of sub zero mm -hmm. rates, negative interest rates. One, it's becoming more common. Two, it's also becoming a bit more murky, you know, because of course for every person who says, yeah, this is a good thing, there are people saying it's a bad thing as well. Where exactly do you mm -hmm. sit on that spectrum? So what you currently have, particularly given the negative interest rate experiment that many central banks across the globe at the moment are undertaking, are still very mixed results. Um, so if you're looking at the economic results, and the reason why you should actually have negative interest rates in the first place, meaning particularly to have higher inflation as well as higher growth, here the result is very mixed. On the other hand, you could say from a financial markets perspective actually that uh, the result so far has led to, some people say, even distortions in the markets mm. and others say new challenges. Um, so clearly what we have seen is very much of a mixed picture. Longer term, um, we do think that um, negative interest rates as part of the wider set of policies available to central bankers could help, uh, leading to just that, meaning higher inflation as well as growth. Um, but in the short term, the jury's still out. So, so, so maybe then that is the important thing, that we do take a long-term view on this. And it's very easy to get caught up in the short term, especially mm -hmm. when we see negative market reactions and like. Mm -hmm. Maybe the most important thing is to say, well, and there are plenty of countries, you know, like Japan, which have done this for a long time and survived with mixed results, to mm -hmm. be fair. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's the long-term view that is the crucial one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it is the long-term view. And um, so from an economic perspective, um, we do see, for example, in Europe, tepid signs of loan growth, which is one area that we would be looking at in particular um, as part of this overall stance of having higher growth as well as potentially higher investment and in inflation. Um, but specifically for investors, what we are seeing right now is also that investors um, do continue to have a look at something that we've been proposing for a long time, which mm. is specifically limiting your home buyers, start uh, to look more at currency hedging, at the same time also diversify more globally, um, particularly because many of these new policies that we are getting both from the fiscal as well as from the monetary side can lead in the short term to unintended consequences and therefore um, this long-term view that we propose uh, with these portfolio mechanics um, is becoming more and more attractive to many investors also. 
Give me your views, if you would, Maximilian, on the United States. Its economy is obviously so important. It's the wealthiest nation on earth. We are in an election year there as mm -hmm. well. But, you know, what that campaign is also highlighting, among many other things, is the wealth gap, the disparity between the rich and the poor, which seems to be, if not getting worse, then certainly um, not getting any better at the moment. Does the economic environment and the mm -hmm. monetary policy there lend itself to making a positive change there, do you think? So what we do have in the United States is, of course, still a relatively slow recovery since the financial crisis. And clearly what we've had, particularly during the last few years, is a skew towards the higher income segment, both when it comes to employment, but also when it comes to an increase in wealth. And um, there are some signs, however, that we're seeing an improvement in employment, which is broader. So if you're looking, for example, at something that we look at, which is the payrolls diffusion index, uh, that last month actually stood at the highest level since the beginning of 2015. Mm. So that's the areas um, in the economy where you've seen positive jobs growth. Um, so there are some nascent signs that also this recovery is becoming um, more widely uh, participated in uh, among the U.S. Um, households. Overall, with regards to the United States, we are positive here on the economic growth outlook. We do think that, um, generally speaking, the skepticism vis-a-vis -vis the economy is too high. Um, we do continue to see very strong jobs numbers. We do continue to see wage growth. We do continue to see um, relatively strong uh, earnings momentum also when it comes to companies. Um, so all in all, we're quite, we're quite comfortable with the United States as it stands. Maximilian Kunkel from UBS there. We thank you very much for your time this week. Thank you very much. So let's just pick up on the points Maximilian made there about the United States, but show you a side we don't so often see. Yes, the US is the wealthiest nation on earth, we know this, but there are plenty of people living in poverty too, and a lot don't even care there's a presidential election on the way because, well, what difference would it make to them? Kimberly Halkett tells us their story now from West Virginia. Marvin Betson has lived in the mountains of rural Virginia most of his life. Without electricity, running water, even a working toilet. His simple garden provides much of his food, but it's not enough. I come all the way up through the 40s where I didn't have nothing to eat. I still think about them days and it's going to be right back there before long too. His house is less than a two-hour drive from the White House, but he says he's given up on politics. His neighbor also has little faith the next president will bring change to his life. I mean, they, they don't want to seem like they, they don't want to take time to hear you out. They are among the 20 million people in the United States living in what's known as deep poverty, subsisting on less than a few dollars a day. We need more than a plan for the big banks. The middle class needs a raise, and we need more jobs. On the campaign trail, Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton and Republican candidate Donald Trump often address the needs of the middle class. But unlike urban anti-poverty efforts, rarely is chronic poverty in rural areas addressed by federal or even local governments. It does not create the image that people want to give of a community when they're trying to draw in um, travelers and visitors and businesses. A half century ago, Senator Robert Kennedy was among those who vowed to end chronic generational poverty. This country is wealth as wealthy as we are, but this is an intolerable condition. It reflects on all of us. With limited education, a lack of access to medical care, and unstable low-wage work, millions in the U.S., like Marvin, see the obstacles for improving their lives insurmountable. <laughs> there ain't nothing going to change mine. There ain't nothing on the face of the earth to change mine. That's why Marvin says on Election Day he's staying home, convinced his vote will do little to change his life. And still ahead on Counting the Cost, we're in the cloud forests of Costa Rica, sensitive, unique environments where nature and livelihoods are on the line. That's coming up a little later. First, though, to an aircraft carrier off the coast of Naples, Italy, exactly the place you'd think of for the leaders of Italy, France and Germany to hold crisis talks on the European Union. 
crisis because the UK is leaving at some point, of course, and those three powerful leaders want to make sure no one else does. Eve Barker has our report. The Garibaldi aircraft carrier, a bastion of European security, tasked with tackling refugee smugglers and training the Libyan Coast Guard. Here, flanked by Naples' volcanic coastline, the leaders of Europe's three largest economies discuss the existential crisis now facing the EU. Whilst we respect Great Britain's decision, we of course want to reassure the other 27 countries that they can count on a safe and prosperous Europe. We live in a historic moment. Can we dispense with Europe or not? The answer is clear. We need Europe, but a Europe that protects and reinforces national economies. We need a Europe that projects its power abroad to fight the many challenges we face, such as war raging at our borders and terrorism. Earlier, the leaders visited the island of Venta Tene and laid a wreath at the grave of Italian intellectual Altiero Spinelli. The island once held a prison camp where Spinelli, one of the founding fathers of European unity, was incarcerated during Mussolini's fascist regime. This whole meeting is steeped in history and political symbolism, but even before Britain's shock decision to leave the European Union, the bloc was facing some of its biggest challenges ever. The biggest migration of people across the continent since the Second World War, youth unemployment in its southern states, especially here in Italy, and the aftershocks of the Greek debt crisis. If ever there was a need for a rallying cry for Europe, then now is the time. There's also deep concern in Brussels about Brexit contagion. Several nations, France, Hungary, Austria and others, have all seen a surge in support for Eurosceptic parties. Populists think that Europe is the cause of all wrongs. Bankruptcy, it's Europe's fault. Recession, it's Europe's fault. Immigration, it's Europe's fault. Economic woes, it's all Europe's fault. That is not how it is. The EU now plans to offer incentives to African governments to help reduce the flow of economic migrants to Europe. But the EU's divided on how to pay for it. Failure could be dangerous for the French and German leaders. Both face elections next year. Italy's also facing a moment of reckoning with a referendum on constitutional reform in October. Keeping Europe together requires not just a steady political hand, but a belief among ordinary voters that the EU is worth saving. So how acute is the European problem? Well, let's talk to management consultant Bernard Bauhofer in Zurich. He's the founder and CEO of Sparring Partners. Bernard, so much focus has been on the UK, because obviously that's what Brexit is all about. But this has ramifications on the rest of the continent. And, and I guess that's why you have a meeting like this on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's very, very uncertain what's going to happen in, in Europe after the Brexit. And I think the whole continent is shocked, including the politicians. They have a give a strong symbolic sign that they are together. They are very close together. But the uncertainty about the Brexit, how this is going to be untangled, there's a lot of legislation involved, how this is going to affect the sentiment of the people around the continent is, is very strong. So um, I would say the politicians are not sure. What they now really need to show leadership is also they might be not clear of what's going to happen. Um, you, Europe has to be given a new purpose of its, of its values, of its shared values. And it looks like a lot of what the politicians are saying is uh, wishful thinking. It not necessarily reflects what the people are uh, hoping and, and asking and, and mm. uh, requesting from the politicians. Europe as, as a whole is in question. Are there shared values? What are the benefits for the people? I think um, many people just were not giving, uh, receiving a lot from the EU. Uh, by basically, there were the big companies and the politicians and authorities uh, that were the big winners, but not the people in the street, in, in, the, in the small towns in Italy, in, in Germany, mm. in, in England, in, in Portugal, and, and so forth. Now, this is a great task, uh, setting a new purpose and convincing people that the EU is a good thing, and not only a big authority which is controlling um, on a meter level the whole continent and its Okay, and, and we will go back to the likes of, of Italy later on, some specific issues there. What struck me, though, as you talked uh, about Europe moving forward and finding its own positions, is that it's very difficult for Europe because it doesn't know what Brexit is. You know, the, the British Prime Minister Theresa May keeps telling us Brexit means Brexit, which actually doesn't mean anything. Um, 
To that end, is there anything tangible, do you think, that the European leaders can do themselves to put them in a strong position? Because they won't want this process to be entirely led by Britain, will they? Yeah, and uh, I think they need to, to take uh, control of the situation, of the process, also with the UK. But at the same time, it's, it's now crucial that they get the message that so much uh, bureaucracy so much red tape, all these um, controls which affecting people, which affecting enterprises in the country is way too much. They have to be prepared to make cuts also in this thing. They have to reform the EU dramatically. And if they don't get the message, I think the whole project of Europe and the EU will, will certainly fail eventually. And, uh, and, and we also see, and I think a a big uh, danger is also the contagion issue. If uh, the Netherlands uh, won a referendum and other countries, it's very likely that the EU will collapse. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I hope that the politicians, Hollande, Merkel and Renzi, uh, the, the three big ones, will understand the message and, and the urgency of really making reforms. Italy is an interesting point uh, on its own right now, isn't it, with its banking crisis? And I think it's a, it's a good reminder, isn't it, that Europe has its own individual problems to deal with. Greece was the big one, and then there was Spain, and there was Italy, uh, Ireland, sorry, and Portugal. But Italy feels like, if not the flashpoint right now, then could be the next one. Yeah, well, the, many people say that the uh, Italian banking crisis might even be more severe uh, for Europe than the, the Brexit. So this is very difficult to say, as we don't know the outcome and the impact of Brexit. But certainly, um, the, the whole, it's not the only the oldest bank, Monte di Baschi, uh, which has a tremendous um, problem. Uh, and it, it, it failed the stress tests of the ECB. But it's a whole banking system which is undercapitalized. It has a is is sitting on a on a pile of sour loans of non-performing loans in the, in the size of 360 billion um, euro, which is tremendous. Now the big question is, how this can, how can this be resolved? And I think the whole fate of Mr. Renzi is depending on how he's managing this very delicate situation as. Many bondholders are retail investors, not, not, not only institutional investors. So this is going to be, if, it, if their people are being affected by a potential haircut, um, they will certainly not support Mr. Renzi in his reform activities to reform the country. Um, and, he, and if he loses uh, the election, this will certainly affect Italy and whole of Europe. So that's uh, also a contagion situation. When we look at the German banks, even the Deutsche Bank, one of the largest banks in Europe, uh, has a very weak balance sheet, lots of strategic and structural problems. The whole financial industry throughout Europe is affected. So if um, Italy, with the help of Europe, fails to reform the banking system, it might affect the whole banking system throughout Europe and even uh, around the globe. That's Bernard Barhofer talking Europe with us on Counting the Cost. Thank you, Bernard. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Right, to something completely different now, renewable energy. I think we can safely say the benefits are there for all of us to see. But what we have now is some proof that the idea is becoming more of a reality. Have a look at this data compiled by Bloomberg, the world's 20 biggest economies now generating 8% of their electricity from solar farms, wind parks and other green power sources. That is up 70% from a level of 4.6% of energy back in 2010, so it's not bad. Though, of course, fossil fuels continue to dominate electricity supply uh, in many countries, including the big power users of the United States uh, and China. But still, this is good news. And we've got Vincente Lopez y Bormayor with us now from London to talk about it. He's chairman of the UK-based Light Source Renewable Energy, also formerly Spain's National Energy uh, Commissioner. These numbers are good, right? I mean, they are coming off a low base. We have to remember that. But it still looks like a pretty impressive increase over five years. Yes, thank you so much. It's delighted to be here again with, uh, with you. And certainly, this, uh, the story of the last five years, it has been impressive and, and very happy to, to say so. I, I think something has demonstrated that there have been a lot of breakthroughs, very impressive in the renewable sector and particularly in the solar one. Even in countries where the solar radiation is not very impressive as uh, UK, but it was a combination of factors that has allowed to have this very good performance and very good outcome from, from the solar point of view. I think solar, it's there, it's here, 
in the energy sector forever. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the UK there because I was just in Scotland for a few weeks actually uh, and I saw uh, solar panels on the roofs of houses there which really made me <laughs> laugh given the amount of uh, sunshine they actually get there. Um, but it shows an interesting <laughs> level of commitment to renewable energy doesn't it? Because I mean if we take Scotland or the UK as an example, uh, wind power is very big. I certainly saw lots of wind turbines when I was there. But it's interesting to see that level of commitment to solar energy in a place like that. Can you explain that to us a little bit more? Yes, I, I, I think you are completely right. Is the level of commitment that these, as I, as I uh, said, a combination of factors. First is the political will and commitment to want to develop this new type of energy system, uh, trying to accomplish the decarbonation objectives. That everybody should be aware of it, and mostly after the COP21 mm. uh, conclusions. Second, it's the financial community is perfectly aware of the importance of this renewable and solar industry in the energy sector. It's a transition that we are living in the energy sector, and because of that, they are um, welcome more than, than never these uh, new energy solutions. And the third, of course, is the capability, technical capability yeah. of the team, of uh, the professional teams that uh, we, within the solar and the renewable uh, industry we have. So the combination particularly of these three factors. Okay, so let's focus on the second one that you brought up there, the financial one, because I'm guessing costs have to have come down here, because that was always the argument, wasn't it? Particularly with solar energy, it was all just too expensive um, for the returns you got. Have those costs come down? That's right, but, the, but the, the reality is the cost of the solar industry drop year by year by year since uh, 2010. Of mm. course, we got its subsidies. There is no any energy sector and industry throughout history that has not received subsidies and support, economical support. We need it a little bit more, but we are in conditions to put it subsidies out in, a, in a, I think, in the near future. But uh, what is a reality, undoubtedly reality, and we have dropped prices, not only prices of uh, exploitation, but prices from construction, from exploitation, from development of this industry very rapidly in a historical rate. Vincente Lopez Ibor Mayo, pleasure talking to you again. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much indeed, sir. And while we're talking about changing technology, it's worth mentioning history made in Singapore this week uh, when it became the first country to trial a self driving taxi service. The company behind the launch is called Newtonomy. And members of the public were able to hail the taxi using its smartphone app. Rival Uber wants to do the same thing in Pittsburgh in the US before the end of August, so clearly it's a big push to uh, get self-driving technology into the public sphere. Finally this week, the cloud forests of Costa Rica. This is a lot like a, a fog forest, persistent mist and moisture which hangs around at canopy level. Beautiful to experience for sure. But in Costa Rica, they're being threatened by rising global temperatures and could soon be gone. Andy Gallagher has our report from Monteverde. In a country that has more than its fair share of natural beauty, the cloud forests of Monteverde stand alone in their unique nature. Atmospheric conditions have to be perfect to maintain so much biodiversity, and this famed national park attracts more than 200,000 visitors a year. Park ranger Ronnie Brenes tells us people come for the beauty and because the park here is so well looked after. I know you hate the sun, little buddy. But biologist Richard Laval has real concerns about the future. He's been collecting scientific data in Monteverde for almost half a century and says rising temperatures are a direct threat to the cloud forests. As a species, we're, uh, we're self-destructing and uh, even if we wanted to self-destruct uh, intentionally, we couldn't do a much better job than we're already doing. And Richard Laval isn't alone in his conclusions. Other scientists say lowland species of plants and animals are steadily moving into what's left of the forest, whilst others are retreating in search of cooler temperatures. Essentially then, this incredibly unique place is a super sensitive barometer to climate change. And researchers say they've already lost two species of frog that only exist here. And others in the area say they're seeing changes too. 
Aldemar Salazar has been farming organic coffee on the edge of the cloud forest for 20 years, but his business is now under serious threat. In the last couple of seasons, 80% of his crop has been killed by a fungus that never grew here before. Climate change and sudden differences in temperatures during the day make the perfect environment for the rust fungus to develop. That's what is causing so much damage to our coffee plants. Globally, cloud forests are rare and delicate. They make up just 1% of the world's wooded areas. But if the scientists are right about what's happening here, they may be in real danger of disappearing altogether. And that is our show for this week. More for you online, though, at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That's our page. Individual reports, links, entire episodes are all there for you to catch up on. You can also get in touch with us. You can tweet me at Kamal AJE. Please use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or just drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria. From the whole team, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.